So in the previous video, we talked about the first derivative test, right? Which, if you recall, is a way we basically took a critical point and decided whether it was a max, a min, or none of the above. In this video, we're going to be talking about the second derivative test, which is essentially going to do the same thing for us. It's going to take a critical point and it'll tell us whether that's, that critical point is a max, a min, or none of the above. So that's basically the... So this is the intuition we're gonna, gonna use for that. So if you remember from the previous video, right, we're looking at the same graph here. The, the, way, we found, the way we figured out how the first derivative test works is that we, we found these, these, um, these max, this max and this min here, and we looked at what the first derivative was doing around that specific point. So we noticed that to the left, the first derivative was positive, right? And to the right, it was negative. And for the min, it was just the opposite. To the left, it was negative, and to the right, it was positive. Right. So that's that sign switch is what was what we used for the first derivative test. Now I'm going to ask you another follow-up question here. Given what's happening here, what would you say at each of these extreme values? What would you say is happening, or what's the sign of the second derivative? What's happening with that? Take a second, think about that, and we'll talk about it. Well, let's quickly revisit what the second derivative actually tells us. Well, the second derivative, if you remember, is basically going to be the instantaneous rate of change of the first derivative. Right? That's basically what that is. Now, so that's what that is. Let's see if we can use that to make some conclusion. So let's... So given this, let's see if we can use the first derivative's information to make a conclusion about the second derivative around each of those um, extreme values. So let's look at the max first. Well, around the maximum, notice how the first derivative, it's initially positive, right? Then it goes to zero, and then it starts, it becomes negative. So essentially what's happened is around our maximum, our first derivative has gone from increasing to zero to decreasing. So effectively, that tells us that our first derivative is decreasing, right? So therefore, the sign of our second derivative around that maximum is less than zero. It's going to be negative. The sign of our second derivative is negative, right? Let's see if we can apply a similar logic for the minimum. So here, our first derivative starts negative, right? It starts negative. Then we hit zero at our, at our minimum, and then it starts, it becomes positive, right? So it goes from negative to positive, right? So what this tells us is that around this minimum, our first derivative is actually increasing, right? It's going, it's getting bigger and bigger. So therefore, around this minimum, we can say that our second derivative is gonna be greater than zero, right? So that's the kind of intuition we're using here to really set up the second derivative test as a useful mechanism for us. All right, so let's briefly go ahead and just formally tabulate everything we've learned so far, right? So let's, let's see be some critical point of our function. And here's a little a small detail that's important. The second, the first derivative, the first derivative has to be equal to zero at this critical point. What I mean by this is, you might think, well, duh, the critical points are where the first derivative is equal to zero, but you might, you might also remember that the definition of a critical point also includes places where the first derivative is undefined. So therefore, what this tells us is that f prime of x cannot be undefined. So f prime of x must be defined here. If the first derivative is not defined at this particular critical point, the second derivative test uh, breaks down, so we can't really use it. Right? So given this, let's here's what we can conclude. So if our second derivative is positive, we have a minimum, right? And this would give us this this kind of upward parabola shape. Right? If our second derivative is negative we'd have a maximum, and that would give us this kind of inverted parabola shape, right? And 
if our second derivative was equal to 0, right, if it was equal to 0, then in this case, the test is inconclusive. Right? Because if it's 0, then it actually doesn't tell us any useful information about what's, what's really happening. So really here, we would actually just have a sad face. So that's all this information we have for this test here. Before we start talking about some examples here, let's make a quick distinction between this and, this and the first derivative test. The second derivative test only requires you to plug into one function. So let's quickly write that down. We only need to plug into one function. Now that's pretty nice, right? It makes some of our calculations a little bit easier. So that's basically one of the advantages to the second derivative test. So it's not as reliable as the first derivative test. There are places where it doesn't work, places where it's just very challenging to take the second derivative. But when we can use it, it's it's pretty nice because we only need to do one uh, numeric calculation as opposed to two that we need to do with the first derivative test, right? So let's run through some examples to get an idea of what's going on. All right, let's talk about these. Let's talk about this example. So we want to find and verify all our extreme values for that function right there. So the first step is going to be the same as always. We're going to find our critical points. So we're going to find our critical points. And to do this, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our first derivative, which is a power rule here. So we're going to have 3x squared minus 27. We're going to set that equal to 0. And now, we can, if we solve this equation, we get that x squared equals shove the 27 over there, divide by 3, we get x squared is equal to 9, and then x is plus or minus 3. So we really have two critical points um, for this particular problem. Okay. The next thing we do, come over here, is we're going to go ahead and we're going to take our second derivative at each critical point. So we're going to find f double prime of c. So let's go ahead and do that. So if we take our second derivative, that's going to come out to the derivative of this piece right here. So we can just look here. Uh, if we do another power rule, we're just going to get that. It's going to be actually pretty nice. It's just going to be 6x. Okay. And now we plug in each critical point, right? So we take f double prime of positive 3 which is going to be 6 times positive 3, which is 18. And this guy, is, uh, this guy is actually going to be greater than 0. So what conclusion can we make? Well, we know that that's, now, that's going to be a minimum value. Fantastic. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to plug in the other critical point. So we do this, we find the second derivative, we're going to plug in negative 3 this time. So 6 times minus 3, and that's going to be minus 18. Now this is actually going to be less than 0, right? And because this is the case, the conclusion that we can draw is that this is actually going to be a maximum. Okay, so that's kind of the steps we go through to solve these kinds of problems. If you found this video helpful, please do like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, and check out some other videos. See you next time!